what to start while colleagues are joining and then. Okay. Um, well, I don't think you know, need much from me other than I'm Lisa from the GPC. I'm very pleased to be um, the designated host for this webinar, but you won't hear very much from me because I'm going to hand it over to um, Martine and the other colleagues. So thanks for joining our third session. I think many of you would have been at the OACHR human rights session, so hopefully these will build on it for each other. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off, turn your mics on and hand it over to you. So I hope it's going to be a great session. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for this and, and welcome. So uh, we, are, we are very happy to have a, an help desk uh, coordinator in place for the Global Protection Cluster to bring yeah. us all together. So we are also part of the of, of the support structures that are there for, for all of you colleagues in, in the field. Uh, my name is Martina. For those who don't know me, I'm the co-chair of the task team on law and policy um, with UNHCR, the Division of International Protection, together with my colleague, uh, Catherine, who is also online. Uh, Catherine, if you'd like to just introduce yourself as well. Uh, yes, Ketsura Katrine. Uh, I am uh, so co-leading together with Martina and uh, the other hats that I'm carrying is a global ICLA lead for uh, or with NRC, the Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, excellent. And so, um, Lisa, if you'd like to just go to the next slide. Uh, as you said, this session on legal aid and access to justice and legal aid analysis really uh, builds on the previous sessions that uh, was conducted by USCHR colleagues and GPC uh, on the human rights analysis. But before we get into the into the substance of today's discussion, we just wanted to say a couple of words of introduction about the task team and what we are doing in case um, for the colleagues that are less familiar with our work. But this task team was established back in 2015, really with the idea of uh, coming together around law and policy engagement uh, and really looking at support in states and our colleagues working with states, um, particularly in supporting and uh, promoting states' efforts in developing and implementing relevant legal and policy frameworks with a, with a big focus on uh, internal displacement, um, but not exclusively. And so uh, we've been increasingly looking at uh, other areas as a part of our efforts in supporting not only the development of uh, adequate frameworks, but also the, the implementation of these frameworks. We have, over the past couple of years, started a project specifically dedicated to legal aid in humanitarian settings, and our first presenter, Paola Barsanti, uh, will tell us a little bit more about the project and the tools that we have developed. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, just to say how the the task team uh, on law and policy, you know, operates. Uh, we have been supporting um, capacity building and advocacy efforts of, of for you at the country level. We also have some um, earmarked fundings that we can use and limited, you know, but they have been helpful in supporting some of you in the field with dedicated um, activities. So please reach out to us if this is something that you'd like to discuss. Um, but we. We've also been supporting knowledge uh, sharing, organizing, for example, well, webinars, of course, and other forms of exchange of uh, knowledge around different topics and including among member states on the topic of uh, implementation and development of law and policy on internal displacement. And of course, through the production of guidance, developing tools, providing technical advice when these processes are ongoing, um, supporting legal analysis. Um, and, and, and this is a little bit more what we're going to talk about today. Um, and working with the uh, academic and other you know, researchers uh, to develop specific studies on, on topics that are all of, of concern to all of us. And some of you might remember, for example, the one on making arbitrary displacement a crime law and practice. Uh, and we, we can share maybe a couple of links in the chat now while Paola will start her presentation. And in fact, with this, I would go straight to the next slide and introduce um, Paola has been working with us. Many of you probably already know her uh, as a legal, as a consultant, uh, you know, working with us, uh, really leading on the uh, project on legal aid in humanitarian settings. Uh, and I will just give the floor to her to let her uh, tell us a little bit more about the project in itself, this tool that we have developed for legal analysis and, um, and how they link to the protection analytical frameworks that you're all familiar with and, uh, and, and, and start today's discussion. Thanks so much, Paula, please. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, Kat and Lisa, for organizing this session. Uh, I hope it's going to be interesting for all of you, and in particular for those of you, uh, protection cluster uh, coordinators and co-coordinators who, who have in their countries legal aid and access to justice at the center of the uh, intervention in the protection sphere. Uh, the uh, agenda today uh, is going to be structured around uh, three main points. The first one, we, would, we wanted to take the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the project uh, rationale, what we did, what we have developed so far through the project, uh, and give you an overview of the lessons learned throughout the project. Uh, the second part of the presentation, of my presentation, will focus on the LAF, so the Legal Aid Analysis Framework, the tool that we would like uh, you to be familiar with at the end of the session. We are are very happy then to provide you more uh, bilateral training or uh, facilitation workshop in case you're interested. And then uh, colleagues from uh, other organizations, partners, organization of UNHCR are going to share their learning about the LAF implementation. So the countries where the tools uh, that we developed within the project have been used and what uh, are the results of the uh, analysis. Um, uh, uh, I imagine that you have access to the uh, chat, so please feel free to use it to uh, send us comments or uh, questions, and we will have a question and answer uh, session at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please, Lisa, thanks. Uh, so, just a few words on why we decided to engage in 2021 uh, on this project. Uh, for most of you, uh, this is uh, obvious because you work in the field and you know how legal aid and access to justice should be at the center of protection programming. Um, in most contexts, uh, legal aid ensure helps ensuring the right to the legal identity and to be recognized in front of the law, uh, especially for forcibly displaced people. Uh, legal aid help reestablish rights and is a key uh, in some more development and transition context to attain uh, SDGs. It supports access to humanitarian development and government assistance, and in some countries or in context, it helps to contribute to uh, the prevention of marginalization and poverty, which are at very often root causes of the country, of the caries. Um, in a transitional and conflict conflict, context, legal aid also helps uh, with uh, access uh, ju to justice for victims of human rights violations uh, to help reconciliation processes and uh, uh, peace. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, very often, uh, even though legal aid and access to justice should be at the center of the protection programming, uh, it does not uh, happen. Uh, through the two years of implementation of this project, we have been able to um, consult with uh, many uh, protection clusters, leads and co-leads, their members and other actors outside the protection cluster. And we uh, 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 developed a knowledge about the reasons why uh, legal aid and access to justice are not often prioritized as they should. First of all, uh, one of the concerns that was raised by many is that uh, legal aid and access to justice are very sensitive and in many countries they uh, are uh, subject to politicization, in particular in transitional uh, justice context. Um, it's also a sector, a subsector of the protection sector that uh, is characterized by high complexity. And uh, uh, the staff that have to undertake and carry out legal aid and access to justice programming need to be very much qualified and SOPs specialized have been have to be put in place in order to ensure quality programming. It often requires a in-depth study of the roots, causes of the, the, the crisis and also of the general justice uh, landscape before uh, operating. So uh, it needs really to come jointly together 
development and humanitarian actors uh, to analyze the justice sector as such before uh, carrying out uh, quality legal aid and access to justice? Is it often therefore deprioritized? De and it has to be linked by its nature with long-term uh, requirements as the justice journey, especially for those victims who have suffered human rights violation, uh, are long and require uh, um, investment and, and time. Next, please. Is it uh, with this background that uh, the task team on law and policy, which Martina just uh, uh, presented, decided uh, almost two years ago to launch this project with the following objective that you can see on the screen. Uh, to help uh, protection cluster lead and co-lead and their um, development humanitarian and peace and, and human rights uh, actors to position uh, legal aid and access to justice at the core of the protection programming. Another objective of the um, of the, the project was to strengthen uh, the humanitarian development nexus, uh, recognizing access to justice as an element uh, key for both emergency response and sustained recovery. Uh, one of the, um, the main objective of the project was also to support with the development of uh, different tools, uh, the um, analysis uh, of the legal aid and access to justice landscape in crisis setting. And this we will uh, go a little bit more in detail uh, during the course of the presentation. I would just like to, uh, to um, emphasize here the uh, word joint, the idea of the uh, task team on law and policy project legal aid in humanitarian setting was really to produce a set of toolkit that could facilitate dialogue among different stakeholders and coordination as such. Uh, one of the um, main characteristics of the task team on law and policy, as Martina mentioned at the beginning of the um, of this event is that it's composed by uh, UN agencies, INGO, national NGOs with, diff with specialized expertise in particular for this project on legal aid and access to justice. But their perspective and their background and their uh, expertise is very different, uh, being them uh, uh, humanitarian, human rights, peace and uh, development actors. And that's, I think, the beauty or the added value of this project and the toolkit that we're going to present today. Another and last um, objective of the project was to highlight best practices at national and regional levels through cross-learning uh, events. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, just a, a very quick overview of the project. Uh, as I said, uh, the task team on law and policy spent uh, the majority of the uh, the first year, uh, the, the the last bit of 2021, uh, to conceptualize the project as such. And this was done through a, a broad survey to which more than 120 uh, members of the protection clusters uh, present in crisis context, more both uh, IDP context, refugees and asylum seeker context, but also mixed migration context, were able to input in the conceptualization of the project and really share concern about uh, coordination, partnership, uh, fundraising, training needs on legal aid and access to justice. It was uh, this field survey that served as the basis to develop uh, the toolkit uh, throughout the project. The second phase of the project uh, in 2022, the first six months, were was devoted to develop uh, knowledge and tools. And from 2020, 22 onwards, uh, we devoted uh, all the energies to uh, share uh, these tools uh, to train uh, different uh, country teams, the ones that were interested in using this toolkit, uh, as well as to support um, with uh, uh, technical and financial uh, resources the implementation of the toolkit in different contexts. Uh, it's with pleasure today that we can share the results of uh, um, some of the countries who have undertaken the analysis using the toolkit. Uh, thank you. Next.
slide. Uh, thanks. Uh, as I said, uh, the uh, the uh, the presentation today is going to focus on the legal aid analysis framework, which is the tool designed uh, to facilitate comprehensive assessment of the legal aid and access to justice uh, landscape in a given country or territory affected by a crisis. But uh, I invite you to go to the link that I uh, um, think uh, uh, Martina just shared in the chat uh, to actually navigate the website of the project where you can find uh, a rich uh, to uh, uh, overview of the tool uh, that we develop throughout the life of the project. In particular here, I just mentioned the virtual library on legal aid in humanitarian settings, where uh, we tried to create a living uh, repository of documents, reports, uh, capacity development material and training on this uh, sphere of action. Uh, the results of the survey that I just mentioned at the beginning, uh, where you can uh, really in seven pages uh, appreciate the wealth of knowledge that comes from the field, uh, from expert practitioners on legal aid and justice in private settings, and a document that makes um, the, the, the core of the legal aid uh, and analysis framework, which is the conceptual framework, which is the glossary of key concepts and definitions, which have been translated in Spanish, uh, French and Arabic, uh, that we hope can be useful in the countries where uh, uh, development, humanitarian, human rights and peace actors want to come together uh, to discuss the uh, access to justice sphere of action and start from a, a common uh, language and definition. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for the next uh, slide. In the second phase, as I said, we uh, also provided the opportunity uh, for colleagues from different uh, crisis contexts to come together and exchange on good practices and lessons learned uh, in the implementation of uh, legal aid and access to justice programming. In particular, in the website, you can find recordings from three webinars that we uh, organized uh, in the course of last year. The first one on, uh, on legal aid in reparation context, uh, the second uh, which took place in May on legal aid to protect the legal identity, and the third on legal aid in customary and informal justice uh, crisis setting. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for the next slide. Uh, let me now enter in the second part of the presentation, uh, which uh, uh, is devoted to really go uh, a little bit more in detail on the legal aid and access to justice toolkit, and in particular on what we called uh, to be a little bit uh, uh, brief uh, laugh. Uh, legal aid analysis framework. Uh, the toolkit is uh, uh, composed by uh, three tools. The first one, as I mentioned before, it's a conceptual framework where you can find a glossary of uh, terms and concepts. As you, as you know, as uh, you are all expert and field uh, practitioners in crisis settings, each organization uh, has its own uh, glossary of terms and many defined uh, legal consultations legal information session, legal awareness session in different mentors. What we try to do within the legal team, uh, the, the task team on, on um, on law and policy, and in particular uh, within this project, is really to combine those definitions and to try to uh, adopt a common language when developing the analysis. Uh, the second uh, uh, tool is really the analysis tool, which in itself is a not very user-friendly uh, Excel table, uh, but that can be adapted to each and every country or territory crisis context, uh, which which I'll present in a minute, uh, and the guidance note, uh, hopefully a very user-friendly guidance note divided in two sections. The first one that explains in uh, detail the purpose and scope and structure of the tool, and the second that gives uh, practical tips on how to uh, use the, uh, and suggestion on how to use the tool in practice. Uh, next, please. 
what is the legal aid analysis framework? Uh, in itself is uh, a matrix, uh, so it's a set of uh, macro and micro questions organized around pillars, subpillars, and categories uh, around uh, the uh, need to organize existing quantitative and qualitative data and information on legal environment, justice system, and legal aid needs, and existing capacities and responses at country or territory level. So the, um, the framework that uh, I'll present is not a data collection tool, it's more a framework to organize existing data on the justice system and on legal aid needs, uh, and it's a, um, it's a tool and a, a means to facilitate a dialogue around structuring an analysis on legal aid. Uh, the idea of the LAF is to really achieve a stronger evidence-based con conclusions on different pillars in order to develop joint action. Uh, as for the PATH, I imagine that many of you are uh, familiar with the protection analysis framework. You will see very many uh, similarities between the two frameworks because they were really uh, built uh, together and they are um, uh, building on each other uh, strands. Uh, uh, as for the PATH, the, uh, uh, protection, the legal analysis framework is really a tool that uh, wants to to uh, facilitate dialogue uh, among the protection uh, cluster members around legal aid and justice. Also, if used over time, it could facilitate monitoring uh, changes in the experience of the justice uh, journey by uh, displaced population. Uh, next, please. So this is uh, how it looks like uh, in practice. Uh, so the, uh, the tool is uh, uh, structured around the four main pillars. The first one is the legal aid and justice context. So in analysis that in, in almost all the countries exists already and uh, which the, the path uh, helps add in details on protection risk. The LAF, uh, the legal aid analysis framework, goes more into detail into uh, the legal normative institutional frameworks around justice and legal aid. It really uh, tries to zoom in uh, the uh, uh, legal aid uh, framework, uh, looking at the existing institutions and the existing legislative and normative uh, landscape around uh, this sector. The second pillar uh, looks at uh, the legal aid issues or legal aid needs or justice needs as the majority of development actors call them. So the uh, justice needs proper to the whole of population and in particular of uh, the crisis affected population. Uh, so the idea here is really to um, collect and analyze data on the typology of legal aid needs, the main actors involved in causing or provoking those needs and the origins of those needs. In some contexts, the origins of the needs will differ from the consequences of those needs. For example, the third pillar is in, instead focusing on what those legal aid needs actually um, provoke and cause on the individuals and community. Uh, the framework of uh, legal safety and dignity are used there to facilitate the reflections on what uh, legal aid needs can actually impact, uh, on how legal aid needs can actually impact the enjoyment and fulfillment of uh, human rights. 
I'll give you an example here. So, for example, if one of the main legal aid issues is lack of uh, legal and civil documentation, in Pillar 2, uh, the actors involved in the analysis will look at what are the causes for the lack of legal and civil documentation, confiscation by the government, loss and destruction, the inability to reach civil registries or institution in charge of issuing or repairing or renewing legal aid legal and civil documentation, while in the third pillar, uh, the actors involved in the analysis will collect data around the impact of lack and legal and civil documentation on the ability of displaced population to vote if they are internally displaced people and have the right to vote, but also on their freedom of movement, if they are refugees and asylum seekers, as well as uh, IDPs, on their ability to enjoy economic and social uh, rights, uh, but also not to be detained uh, by uh, the authorities. Part of the third pillar is also uh, the analysis of coping strategies, both uh, positive and negative, in order to really dig in on the ability of individuals and community to react to those legal aid needs identified in pillar two. The fourth pillar, uh, I always say that I think it's the most important one for humanitarian actors, very often uh, as humanitarian actors, we don't have the, the time uh, for the nature of uh, the intervention and for the urgency of the crisis to really take the time to uh, look at the existing capacities of uh, uh, at local and national le uh, level to respond to the legal aid needs or justice needs identified. So if in the first pillar, uh, the, uh, leg the legal aid uh, analysis focused on the normative and legislative framework around access to justice, the four pillar in, instead focuses on the capacities. And the four pillar is uh, structured around uh, um, three uh, sub, sub pillar. The first one, the affected population. So what are the existing capacities at individual and community level to respond, address, solve uh, the legal aid needs? Uh, the second sub pillar is around the legal aid actors. So, so the civil society, the existing civil society, legal aid actors, and justice actors who are providing solutions uh, to uh, those legal aid uh, needs identified, what their capacity and what are their the services that they are currently providing. What's the quality, if it's possible to find it for me, existing information about the quality, the coverage. Uh, the, the gender, the ability to respond to gender issues of the services provided by uh, legal aid actors uh, from civil society, but also from the international um, arena. And the third the sub pillar around the, the, the four pillar of existing capacity is looking at duty barriers. So, um, is there, uh, is there uh, a Minister of Justice uh, Department of Legal Aid Provisions which, uh, for which crimes uh, uh, legal aid, free legal aid is uh, provided? Uh, which crimes are instead not covered? Uh, which civil uh, or administrative matters uh, are not mentioned in the law in terms of the ability to be provided with uh, a lawyer. Uh, so this is really looking at the ability of the state authorities, both at local and um, national level, to respond and address to uh, justice needs. But also in uh, less, uh, um, uh, let's say, in, in countries where uh, formal and informal uh, justice system and mechanism are present, uh, this pillar contains a section on questions uh, and uh, uh, both macro question and ma micro question on the ability uh, and the existing and the coverage and the quality of services provided by uh, informal uh, uh, and customary uh, justice systems and mechanisms. So that the uh, pillar four can give a 
overview of what uh, uh, the state is capable to offer to crisis affected population and of course what are the gaps to be re responded to but also uh, the uh, informal and customary uh, system and the ability for individuals and communities to be referred to those and the ability of those structures to respond to the justice needs identified. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for the next slide. Uh, so, as you can appreciate from the previous slide, the uh, the analysis framework is quite complex and uh, it's quite uh, broad. Uh, the idea was to offer a menu uh, of options to a protection cluster coordinator, co-coordinators and their members uh, to be able to uh, analyze the justice landscape in a, uh, in a given country or territory affected by the crisis. Nevertheless, uh, I think it's important to uh, highlight that the legal aid analysis framework is a modular tool. Uh, so uh, either a single agency or a group of agency or a protection cluster itself is invited to use the LAF and adapt it to uh, the uh, country context. So either to uh, focus on one pillar or to focus on one legal aid needs and apply all the pillars or to conduct the entire uh, legal aid and justice analysis. Uh, it is applicable uh, and it is designed to be applicable uh, to any context and at any uh, uh, given steps or stage of the uh, crisis. And in fact, as we will see from the colleagues who are presenting today uh, and others that have not been able to join today, but I have used the, the laugh in the field, it has been used both in transition uh, and protracted crisis, but also in acute emergency. It has been used in uh, in a particular a particularly affected territory uh, in countries or uh, as a uh, cross border uh, tool the framework as i mentioned at the beginning is intended for international and national development humanitarian and human rights uh, actors and was designed exactly uh, trying to grasp both uh, um, sectors um, uh, language, uh, needs and perspectives. Normally, who leads the analysis is the legal aid analysis team, according to resources available in the country, uh, a consultant, uh, a national consultant was hired to lead uh, the data collection and data uh, gathering, let's say, and the analysis was then conducted by a core team of interested uh, um, agency of course depending on the resources and the scope of the uh, of the analysis uh, particular experts were called upon to actually conduct uh, the analysis next please Um, I would like to um, end my presentation with a practical uh, seven-step guidance that you can uh, find also more in detail into uh, the uh, guidance note on the LAF. Uh, this is how uh, the analysis could actually look in practice and looked in practice in the countries that uh, have decided to undertake the analysis. Uh, so the exercise started with a kickoff meeting, uh, kick off a workshop among interested agencies, either within the protection cluster team or uh, among teams of different agencies interested in conducting an analysis of the sphere of action. Um, the second step was, of course, to clarify the scope, objective and the output of the uh, analysis. So, for example, just to give you an example, in Iraq, the, uh, the analysis analysis looked at the uh, legal aid uh, need of minority groups and the objective was really to gather a deep analysis, legal analysis of the legislative framework 
but also on the practical in, implication of the limitation of the legislative framework on this topic uh, in uh, some areas of uh, the country. And the output in that case was uh, decided to be a report that was then used as an advocacy uh, report by UNHCR and the protection cluster in their uh, dialogue with relevant authorities. This is just an example, but uh, colleagues from the field will uh, share uh, more. Um, the third step will be uh, defining the methodology, the milestones of the, pro of the process, among which the fourth step is to recruit an, a legal aid analysis team who will conduct a desk review uh, to understand the uh, availability of the existing data and information, but also to identify particular gaps in the information that could be filled in uh, by part, uh, um, uh, specific data collection exercise. Uh, the uh, core of the uh, exercise is the analysis and the um, conclusions. Uh, a previous slide, please. Um, the analysis and the consultation with uh, this relevant stakeholders. And I think this has been proven to be uh, the core of the uh, of the exercise, in particular uh, in Iraq, but also in other countries, uh, the uh, exercise ends with a validation workshop where where all the stakeholders. In some contexts with the national counterparts where it's possible, uh, the findings are validated and really become the basis for a coordinated or uh, joint uh, action uh, and intervention in the sector. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Martina. Thank you so much, uh, Paola. I think uh, it's not easy to give a, a big overview of the of the of the tool. You know, which is of course, um, it's a little bit. It may be. It may look a little bit overwhelming when you first see it. And I just wanted to say to colleagues um, that on the website, these tools are all available also in multiple languages. Actually, they're also available. They have been translated in French and Spanish and Arabic. And um, and and one objective for 2024 for us is also to to look at the digitalization, hopefully, of these tools to make it a bit more user friendly um, for all of you. Um, but now um, we will, uh, and, and I invite colleagues also, if you have already any, any questions, anything that just comes up, you know, that have come to your mind while Paola was presenting, please don't hesitate to add anything in the chat. But also now I would love to just give the floor, in fact, to Claire Merat from NRC, because we would like now to have you listen to um, some colleagues who have been using these tools in the field directly to hear about their experience and uh, to learn from them on uh, on uh, uh, why and how they're using it uh, uh, and some of the lessons learned from these processes. So please, uh, Claire, the floor is yours. And just to say the class, yes, we'll speak about the experience of using it, yes, in Li in Libya and uh, on the Tunisia side as well. I don't know, Claire, if, if, if that, to the extent that it's relevant, please. Thank you so much, Martina and uh, Paola. Um, so yes, today uh, I am uh, with uh, our colleagues from Dyer, uh, DRC, sorry, uh, who will be able to uh, explain a bit on the exercise that has been undertaken and led by DRC in Tunisia. But uh, for the first part of our discussion, I will uh, present on behalf of um, of my colleagues from uh, DRC and IRC uh, on our initiatives that is uh, called Justice Bridge. Um, so I am Claire Murat uh, and I work as uh, information counseling and legal assistance specialist for NRC uh, in Libya. Um, and with uh, my other colleagues from the steering committee, Angeliki uh, and Eliab, who couldn't be here with us today. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm presenting on behalf of uh, the initiative. Um, so before going uh, through our uh, learning exercise, just a bit of, uh, of background on how uh, NRC, DRC and IRC uh, came together uh, to, um, to use uh, the legal analysis framework 
uh, together. Um, so Libya has been mirrored, yes, in a prolonged protection crisis since, uh, um, yes, uh, since um, the hostilities and violence that erupted since 2011 in the country. Um, and in uh, December 2022, uh, there was a new structure, a new coordination structure um, that is led by UN agencies and they're the UNSDCF structure. So there is no more uh, sectors uh, coordination. So the protection sector has been deactivated uh, since then. So in terms of coordination specifically for protection issues uh, in the country, it was more difficult than to coordinate such initiatives uh, to use on um, on the legal aid analysis uh, framework as it was presented by Paula just before. Um, so since the deactivation of the protection sector, some protection agencies, including uh, NRC, DRC, and NRC, have come together to um, the same uh, analysis and statement that Libya is in what we can call a protection crisis with um, deep protection issues and access to justice issues that are not necessarily um, well coordinated and taken into consideration with a with a bigger picture by protection actors, especially since the um, the deactivation of the protection sector in the country. So still, the acute protection issues and legal aid issues that were experienced by the most uh, vulnerable populations in Libya were not necessarily um, well analyzed and then coordinate for a coordinated approach. So uh, this is how the three agencies came together and agreed to undertake such analysis. Sorry. So the landscape, like what are we looking at when we when we look at the um, uh, legal aid landscape in Libya, we are in um, in a situation of where displacements uh, are still happening, but with a lower impact in terms of displacement related to internally displaced population. Um, there are still some internally displaced population in Libya, but way less than in the past years. Uh, but what we are witnessing is that there is a uh, disrupted access to legal identity in the country with pocket of population, and especially in the southern part of the country that are in a stateless situation um, with, um, yeah, with still access restrictions to, uh, to these populations. So it's very difficult as international organization to access um, these population in the south and support them uh, with uh, with legal support or even protection support. Um, there are as well um, a global um, fragmented judicial system. So the country is divided in, into two uh, geographical areas uh, with um, very difficult access to justice for uh, different parts of the populations and minorities. Um, yes, with the militias that are controlling some parts of the countries and still open hostilities in some instances. So the, the, the legal framework is fragmented in the sense that the laws and regulations can be different from a part of the country to another, but as well the proper implementation and reading of this legal um, framework can be different as well from an area to another. Um, the availability of uh, administrative and legal services are, are different as well from uh, these different parts of the countries with restricted access to uh, legal aid, legal and administrative services in some parts of the country and especially um, for some part of the population. Uh, there are as well some uh, persisting security challenges that jeopardize as well these issues of access to justice and legal aid and legal remedies in, uh, in general. Um, so our, our um, initiative with DRC and IRC, so 
why first why the name of Justice Bridge? Um, Paula explained the whole um, the the tool in itself and and the the global utilization of what the legal aid analysis framework could be, and the idea is not necessarily to use the overall uh, structure, but then choose as per the level of expertise of the agency that are participating, but as well the needs of such analysis, right? And so NRC, DRC and IRC, we work at uh, a humanitarian intervention and the, um, uh, the advocacy efforts that we run are not necessarily to the, um, uh, to the extent of a big policy change and political change and the bigger picture that uh, institutional support agencies could provide, um, for instance, is for the issues that Libya uh, is facing at more structural and, uh, and governmental level. So we do not aim as international organization to sit at this table, but more to be able to feed from our experience and our reading of the situation in our areas of intervention, this bigger picture, hence the name of Justice Bridge, to be able to bridge the gap between humanitarian agencies such as us, DRC and RCIRC, and the institutional support that is provided by uh, the main actors of this UNSDCF structure at global and rule of law level. And we think as um, DRC, NRC and IRC that this gap and uh, this, this gap would benefit um, the overall picture and the, the overall analysis of the needs and root causes of these issues in terms of access to justice and legal remedies with the bigger um, with the bigger picture, and as Paola was mentioning before, these issues of access to justice and denial of basic human rights uh, are most of the time in the root causes of broader uh, conflict um, and, uh, and can jeopardize the peace building process that these um, bigger coordination structures uh, strive to achieve to achieve. So um, we all have um, a role to play and we think that our initiative could uh, could be useful first for um, legal aid and, and legally um, oriented organizations that are providing uh, direct services to specific populations that are in need of legal aid support, but as well uh, so in terms of coordination at coordination level, but as well um, to share with, uh, yes, with the uh, UN Smith Rule of Law partners and with uh, UNDP, UNHCR efforts uh, in, in, yes, in their efforts to uh, peace building um, durable solutions uh, with uh, the Libyan government. So in uh, January 2023, the, the three agencies uh, created the LAF uh, steering group. Um, so in March 2023, we ran a preliminary data uh, collection. So this was shared with the, the three agencies for common analysis. Um, then in um, March 2024, so more recently, um, the Legal Aid Analysis Framework Consultant uh, was hired by DRC and there was a secondary data review and key from an interview, so a run of, uh, of consultations that, that was led uh, by DRC. Um, last week, I mean, a few days ago, uh, DRC uh, led on a consultation and a valid and consultation workshop first, and there will be a validation workshop in the coming weeks. Uh, in Libya, um, and as well in April 2024, so maybe uh, April or May, I mean, this might be um, confirmed by a DRC colleague, there will be as well an internal learning event led by DRC uh, between the use of the legal aid um, analysis framework in Tunisia and 
in Libya because this was one of the objectives of GRC um, using the, the analysis framework to be able as well to draw lessons learned from the use of the framework in different countries. So at institutional level for DRC to be able to draw lessons learned. So this will be more an internal learning event on this um, multi-country use of the, uh, of the analysis framework. In uh, May 2024, we plan to um, yeah, to receive a first draft of the LAF report from the consultant uh, and being able to, uh, in July, complement missing pieces uh, uh, if needed. Um, yes, with complementary data collection from NRC and IRC. So here, we, um, according to our own areas of expertise, so for example, IRC having access to detention centers in the country um, and uh, NRC's expertise on uh, employment rights, on housing and and property rights and access to documentation, being able to complement uh, missing data at um, uh, household level and key informant level. And then having a final draft of our analysis uh, in July 2024. So we foresee that we will be able to invite you all uh, for a learning event in August uh, this year and having a final report after a round of, uh, of learning and being able to adapt uh, the final report thanks to the, the learning events and the validation workshop. In a, So to have a final report by October this year in 2024. So I might want to invite um, my colleague from uh, DRC to compliment uh, if I miss any uh, if I missed any information from uh, from our initiatives if my colleague is yeah, yeah please come forward uh, hi I don't know if you hear me. Yes, we can hear you. OK, that's perfect. All right. Uh, thank you. So um, thank you, Claire, very much. I'm uh, Yad. I'm a legal aid protection specialist uh, with DRC. So uh, yeah, Claire, you, you covered all the, the process of the LAF implementation uh, in Libya. So maybe I can add some like very um, practical uh, things. Uh, yeah, uh, last week we had an um, analysis workshop. It was like conducted uh, in Libya, uh, virtually of course, because it's Ramadan. Uh, and yeah, it was uh, a bit challenging to conduct this kind of workshop. As you might know, uh, the, the political context in Libya, Libya is divided between the East and the West. And uh, so the Tripoli part and the, the, the capital and uh, Benghazi uh, and uh, even the legal uh, system uh, is divided uh, in, in this way. So uh, we decided uh, in accordance with the consultant we hired to, to, uh, to allow people uh, to be present in the analysis workshop from, from, from the eastern part of, of Libya because it's kind of impossible for them to come from Benghazi to, to, to Tripoli to attend the analysis workshop to conduct it um, online. And it was, I, I think it was a, sex, a successful um, uh, successful uh, workshop. Uh, we had um, many uh, representatives of uh, local NGOs, uh, of academia, of uh, even of uh, state uh, representatives. Uh, and uh, yeah, the discussions were really very, uh, very uh, interesting. Of course, uh, a lot of time we had kind of um, um, reference to the, the very complicated political uh, situation in Libya that really has uh, a big influence on, on uh, the, the, the context of uh, providing legal aid services uh, to, to uh, to uh, the beneficiaries, especially uh, now in Libya after the, the, the what happened uh, in Derna, 
uh, there is a context of uh, displaced um, internal displaced person uh, in, in Tripoli coming from Derna to Tripoli with all of the political background uh, uh, like situation in, in Libya. This is on top of the uh, international um, situation, the, the, the migrants that are crossing Libya to the Mediterranean Sea. So we have a very complex um, uh, like uh, needs uh, in Libya. Uh, and this was really very interesting to discuss with the uh, with the stakeholders uh, in in Libya in this respect. Um, yeah, as uh, Claire has mentioned, um, we will follow up the next steps for the for the report. Now the we are uh, as TRC is leading the process with the consultant. We are. Um, uh, uh, examining the first findings that, uh, that comes from the data uh, collection, primary data collection, and from the key informant interviews that ha has been conducted with uh, quite interesting um, stakeholders, uh, judges, lawyers, um, persons that uh, are like um, human rights defenders, uh, NGO representatives. So we have like a variety of uh, of uh, um, stakeholders that has participated either in the workshop or in the key informant interviews. Um, yeah, uh, the findings are, are quite interesting, but uh, now we are um, in a process of uh, receiving the first uh, recommendations and the first uh, draft, the very, very first draft, let's say it um, like this. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then we will follow up uh, uh, next steps till till uh, the end of uh, of the process. Um, I don't know if you have time uh, to talk about Tunisia because um, we'll you you can take a couple of minutes, but then we really would love to hear also from uh, the experience of colleagues in the America and leave some time okay. for question and answer if that's possible. So. Yeah, very, very quickly, because in Tunisia we are also conducting the same process. Um, <clears throat> But we didn't hire a consultant. We are uh, doing it uh, internally. Uh, SDRC is leading also the process uh, of the LAF implementation in Tunisia with other uh, colleagues. NGOs. So we decided to, uh, to to work with with local NGOs based not in the capital but in the the, the south, um, in the region, uh, the border region with Libya. Uh, to connect it to the to the LAF exercise in Libya, because we have some cross-border legal aid uh, needs between Tunisia and Libya, for uh, especially for the population we are working with for migrants. So uh, we decided to focus the legal aid analysis uh, workshop. I mean the legal aid, um, the LAF implementation in in the region of Mednin. Uh, in the border uh, region with Libya, and uh, we are uh, working with some local NGOs uh, who are now part of the steering committee, the Arab Institute for Human Rights and the Child Protection Organization, focusing on some uh, specific vulnerable group needs, such as migrants, of course, but uh, also uh, women who suffer from uh, GBV, um, and and uh, and uh, children who are in conflict of the law. So, uh, and uh, these are the, the the like the main uh, groups we are uh, focusing uh, on in uh, in the LAF exercise in the region of Mednin, with specific attention, of course, uh, on on migrants who uh, have some uh, cross border. Uh, legal aid uh, needs. Uh, in Tunisia, uh, as I said, uh, DRC is leading the, the, the process with uh, some local uh, NGOs. We are we had a um, uh, uh, first workshop, a keep a kickoff workshop and then analysis workshop. And now we are uh, we have constituted the steering, steering committee with the DRC, uh, Arab Institute for Human Rights, uh, Tunisian Refugee Council, and uh, and uh, the uh, Tunisian uh, child organization uh, based in Mednin. And this uh, steering committee will uh, like lead the, the, the process till the end, as, as um, Claire has um, mentioned, uh, like similar to, to Libya uh, process. So uh, that's it very quickly. Uh, no, thanks. 
Thank you so much, Claire. And uh, yeah, I think this is super helpful to really show colleagues that are connected and they, of course, work in different countries with different uh, political and legal administrative context. But I think it really gives the idea that uh, the, the modality also coming together around this, the importance of doing it, the way in which you come together, creating the steering committees, the group of interested parties, as uh, as, as Paula was mentioning uh, uh, Earlier, the work with the with the local NGOs and with the local, you know, the the, the, the colleagues, the, the the type of actors that you're involved, of course, in the in the informant, uh, the, the the key informant interviews to really bring in that local knowledge, all the those pillars that Paula was talking about for the analysis. I think that you really made it very concrete for us, and and we look forward to 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 the rest of the steps uh, as well. To and wishing you the the, the best for that part of the. Conclusion. Also, you have mentioned the the, the cross border legal aid needs. Of course, this, the, the importance of that. This is we know that this is something also we want to be looking at more as a as a as a group. And um, and you have also referred to, in fact, that indeed the use of the legal and legal aid analysis framework for the multi country use. So in this case, we have. Uh, the Libya, uh, Tunisia, uh, but now we would also love to hear from uh, Maria Elena uh, from DLC about the experience also of using these tools in Latin America. Uh, and then I will then continue to invite colleagues to be ready to, to the, if they have questions or comments and reaction to the experience that Claire and Ia that presented on Libya and Tunisia and to learn more from that uh, and their approaches while the, the, the Iraq example that uh, Paola mentioned earlier and I attached the report there in that case for example the, the analysis was conducted under the protection platform as it was mentioned and the leadership of uh, UNHCR as a, as a platform as a cluster lead. Uh, but Maria Elena, uh, welcome. Uh, We're glad to have you with us. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. And we'd love to hear from you and the experience of DLC in using the LAF then in the context of uh, a, a, new, a different set of countries. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, so my name is Maria Elena Hernandez. I am the Regional Protection Coordinator for DRC in Latin America. And I, I would like to share the experience that we have had um, in Latin America with you. I'm just going to um, project my, uh, my screen. Just give me one second. Um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a problem here. Um, I don't think I'm able to to project my screen. Well, meanwhile, I'm just going to um, well, I uh, I figure this out. I'm just going to leave my um, the report that we have produced in in the chat. But just to give you a little bit of background, DRC has worked in the Americas a lot with protection analysis, and um, the context of the Americas. Uh, while it looks more and more like a protracted crisis, what we have seen is the dynamics of the crisis keeps on changing. But um, the crisis, whether it is the mixed migration flows going throughout the region or uh, internal displacement or other situations of violence are very linked to um, legal aid needs. So um, this is the reason behind um, working, uh, deciding to do the, the laugh with, um, uh, for DRC. And this is where uh, we kind of started our, um, I'm going to try to see if I can share with you my uh, my screen. Please let me know if it works. If someone can tell me, I won't be able to see it, but this is the only way I can uh, share it. Hi, Maureen, this is Lisa. I think if you give me one second, I might actually be able to share your uh, presentation. So let Perfect. me see it and then you don't have to share your whole screen. Give me one second. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so when we started doing this, and I'll, I'll just keep on going while we kind of uh, figure it out. But um, so when we started working on, on the lab, we decided to go for a regional. Thank you. Um, so we start. We decided to go for a, a regional analysis, and the reason for that is that the crisis is a regional crisis. While it does uh, affect countries differently, and legal aid needs might vary between countries. The, the affected population does travel across the region. So what I'm going to share with you today, it's a little bit on 
how we've come to this analysis that I shared. Um, for now, we only have the Spanish version, but we hope that we will be able to share an English version with all of you in, in, um, in the near future. So I'll tell you a little bit about how the process was, about a little bit of our challenges and um, some of the conclusions that we, uh, um, we reached after this. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So one of the challenges that we had was um, that uh, it was defining what uh, really it is a legal aid. What does that mean? Um, and because we have worked with the PATH in the past, for those of you who are familiar with the PATH, the PATH is very clear on what a protection, protection threat is. So that facilitates the analysis, right, at the parting point. Whereas for the lab, we really struggle in, in understanding what um, um, a legal aid uh, need is and what how do do we uh, conceive that and what definition do we um, do we share for a common uh, understanding and this was an exercise done uh, from DRC so a little bit different from what my colleagues presented but this but still within for us in our analysis it was important so we decided to go uh, for this definition that you can see in the screen, a situation when a person requires support from legal services to solve a problem that has a legal dimension. Um, and we looked at that to really uh, conceive and, and, and conceptualize what we were talking about and as, as our point of departure in our analysis, what do we mean by legal aid uh, need? Um, so our working definition was this vulnerability of, or threat that requires support from legal professionals to access administrative, judicial, or constitutional mechanisms to advance the guarantee of legal right. As you can see, it's a little bit broad, but for us, it worked very well um, into defining and kind of like um, uh, reducing the scope that we were going to work with. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and, and I think this is key for us. Um, we we really struggled because we had experience of the path having it very conceptualized. And so we came up with a list of potential general legal aid needs uh, that kind of looked um, that when we started doing our first um, information review, they kind of, and, and our own experience in, in the region, they, these were the, the, the kind of legal aid needs that we identified. So we categorized those. Um, a little bit, uh, and it was a bit of a trial and error of what really constitutes a, a legal aid need. For example, we're looking at child protection. We're like, well, what does that really mean? What does family rights mean? And, and I think for us, this was a very interesting process into conceptualizing those those uh, legal aid needs. At the end, for our um, for our report based on this uh, and uh, in our context and again this is very context specific some of them they might not work for your context but i think it's a it's a good starting point to reflect and look at um at the information that's available but also the expertise of the teams and and how they experience this um, um what do they see in the legal aid programs or what do they see in the protection information that they have available so um for our report, we identified six priority, uh, priority legal aid needs, and those are the ones that are developed throughout the report, and then they are they keep on going according to the to the sub pillars. So we look at refugee status, access to refugee status determination and asylum procedures. Procedures. We looked at one category that was very interesting in how we frame it, and that was access to international protection and complementary pathways in the U.S. Um, we, we looked at migratory regularization, um, so kind of legal stay, how do we access legal stay in the context of mixed flows. Um, we looked at um, legal aid needs for uh, internal displaced persons. Uh, we looked at GBB and we look at nationality and civil documentation. So those were the six big legal aid needs that we identified across the region as a priority. But, um, but as I mentioned, this was a lot of effort and I think we invested a lot of time in this uh, to ensure that we will be able to then go forward with analysis and know what we were talking about and create casual links between those legal aid needs and our analysis on the different pillars. Um, if we can go to the next one, please. Uh, so this was our second step. Um, and the third one was using DEEP as our kind of uh, information management platform. And um, what we did or what the team did it was to um, create, use the, the LAF pillars, sub-pillars, and categories to create a project in the deep. So we kind of create a logical framework 
adapting those laugh categories within the DIP to be able to tag all the information sources and organize information sources that we had um, with that potential legally it needs list to systemize um, our information. And that was very important for us because that was, um, in our experience, we have done this with the PATH as well. And this uh, categorization and really organizing the information helped us in creating that casual driven analysis because we did have a lot of information. Um, and we will see it in the next slide uh, and the ne next slide what we used. Wait, um, and we're happy to share uh, how we created this logical framework. If any of you are in, is interested in this, we also have in our website some um, some tutorials on how to use the DIP for, for that. But I think this platform, because we already had the expertise and we knew how to navigate it from previous analysis, was very helpful. Um, and I think that as long as you create that framework, it's important. You don't have to use the DIP for that. You can use other type of information management systems. Uh, but, but what is very important is that you categorize information accordingly because then that organization of the information will help you creating those casual links instead of um, going around and, and losing time in, into really knowing what or are, are the links between the needs um, and the rest of the pillars. Uh, if we can go to the next one, please. So um, we were looking for a regional analysis. And um, and this was very challenging at first. We knew we wanted a regional analysis. We knew that the, we wanted to have a, 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 an overview of the crisis and the legal aid needs as a region. Um, but we decided not to conduct uh, a regional analysis all at once. And, and many of you will say this is obvious, right? Like, I mean, legal aid systems are different and they vary between countries, but this is not really a legal analysis, right? It's about legal aid needs. Um, but we based on our experience again we found very difficult to 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 engage in regional analysis without looking at national level um and, and that was a, a decision on how do we um conduct two level analysis and we also saw it as uh, with an importance of engaging with each country and seeing um what would be the added value of of doing this analysis at the regional level we decided to select six, six countries. Uh, this was more a matter of where the RC has presence or where do we have very strong partnerships um, and, and where it was strategic to do it across the migration route or um, where legal aid needs are very present. So we decided to go for these six countries, um, which is Colombia, Peru, Mexico, Venezuela, Guatemala, and Honduras, uh, with uh, the recognition that we we will start by each country, looking at the legal aid needs, looking at the context, looking at the legal frameworks, looking at capacities, and then and then we will move in to see uh, if we can uh, click again. We will look to see once that we had selected the six countries where we knew we will have access to information, we'll, where we knew we will have the expertise, then we will make comparisons and see similar populations, see similar legal aid needs. Um, can we move forward a little bit, please? Um, so again, identify at country level and then and then trying to look at it. So that was the other part. We decided to do a two-step approach, um, so two-level, sorry, approach. Um, and and then we had to decide what was going to be our data and information. Again, there is so much information available, right? And and, and this is very important as well to kind of. Uh, uh, identify what is useful, what is not useful, what is within the scope, what is not. So um, the, the information that we used was uh, quantitative data for our from our protection monitoring, monitoring that we do in countries uh, within DRC, and those that were available from different sources. So um, that quantitative data that was available um, and did not require any data sharing agreement. So we use some work from um, from UNHCR, uh, UNHCR and we use some uh, data from the US government, especially in terms of encounters at the border. Um, and, and that gave us, because we don't have any presence in the US, so that gave us really that, that, that legal aid need, as I mentioned, on access to international protection and other complementary pathways in the US. So that was our set of quantitative data. Um, DRC has been doing protection monitoring for many years in America, so we already had a good data set on that. Uh, and then we looked at qualitative data from our protection monitoring as well in, in all our countries of operations. So we looked at focus group discussions and key informant interviews, um, and we uh, 
complemented that information when we had information gaps with specific interviews done with key legal aid actors. Um, and that was um, both within DRC and outside DRC. And I think that really complemented the qualitative uh, part of the analysis. Something that we decided to do as well, where we saw a gap, and I think this is uh, going back to what Paola was saying at the beginning of this webinar, was um, the importance of looking at capacities, but also gaps in the response. So we, we um, created a survey, and we can share that as well. Um, and we, we um, shared that survey with uh, many different um, legal aid actors in the region, but also coordination mechanisms. And we, um, we were able to reach 42 legal aid professionals from or humanitarian organization to understand what were their perspectives on the challenges and opportunities in delivering legal assistance in the region. And I think for us that was so important because that was what we were missing. We knew the needs, we knew uh, from our protection monitoring, we had like different sources on the on the different, for example, copying mechanisms that result from legal aid needs. But we didn't have the perspective from the actual providers. And for us, that was so important because we did want to reach some recommendations. And you and those recommendations are at the end of that report that I shared. But for us, this was a gap that we were not able to see. And our sampling was just based in DRC's perception. And while we did choose countries where DRC operated, we wanted to make sure we are not present everywhere. So obviously this will help us in complementing that. So this was a conscious decision to, to kind of bridge that gap, that information gap that existed. Um, and then lastly, but not least, we also looked at reports published by DRC and other organizations. And the information that was prioritized on those um, legal aid reports or um, legal um, uh, related reports, um, we prioritized uh, the, any report that was uh, related to the years 23 and 22, which is kind of the period that this analysis covers. But we did look at certain um, at certain reports that cover previous years, and we use those more into the context and the to, to be able to understand the trends. So these were the data and information that we chose. And as you can see, that's a lot, but we really needed that to, to do a, a more robust analysis. And I think that these, these different types of data sets and information and qualitative uh, sources really helped us in producing a report that can talk that can talk um, about those casual links and not just um, because if not, sometimes we, we look more at the pro overall protection um, needs or risks that let's say, um, instead of just focusing on that causality between legal aid uh, or legal aid needs and, um, and the actual consequences and the capacities of the population and that can inform the response. If we can move forward, please. Um, so then, the, the, the <laughs> once that we had all that, the, the challenge was how do we analyze all this categorized information and data? So obviously, this was done by a team at the regional level in the RC. Um, so we both we have a combination of a team between uh, IM experience, protection experience, and legal experience, mainly based on human rights, refugee law as well. Um, so. What we found very useful was that we have experienced this with the PAF, and I'm going to keep on saying that because the mirror of the PAF and the lab for us has been really helpful in terms of the experience on casualty. Um, and for us, because the PAF was so clear in that uh, in those causal links, um, which is not as explicit in the lab, I may say, helped us just navigating it through in a, in a faster way. What really helped us was were the granular questions. And uh, of course, we don't have time to go through all of that, but we made a list in this presentation that we can share on the granular questions that were super helpful for us in our in the analysis. And I invite you to look at the granular questions to really look at what are you trying to respond and guide you through the analysis, especially when you're doing joint analysis. I think that's very helpful. Um, so if we can go forward. Just because I know that I'm, uh, the time is is very short, so if we can move forward, there's two slides on the on the questions. I'm not going to go through that, um, but again, I'll, I will say that the important part for us, as I mentioned, with that with that survey, was to make 
visible what the legal aid services available were. And I think for us that shows the gaps in the response. Really looking at how do we look at access to, to rights, whether it's judicial or administrative, and the people who have legal aid needs. And I think that linkage for us was very helpful and that informs our response and is going to inform what we're doing um, next. Um, and then finally, uh, just in terms of recommendation for better humanitarian programming, it's trying to link those two. Um, and if we can go to the end of the of the presentation, just to 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 finish with some conclusions and but we're very happy to share again our um, our experience, but um, for for any recommendations that we can give to this group is clarify the definition of what a legal aid needs is and, and then trying to think this doesn't have to be so rigid. I think it depends on the context for us that ended up helping us prioritize those legal aid needs. Uh, adopt strategic analysis and categorization, and that you can do to the granular quest question. And I think with that, you can emphasize with that causal analysis and that interpretation. And I think this is where we can really link other sectors into what we're looking at, because at the end, this remains very technical, right? Like if you open the, the, the our analysis, you will see that 68 pages and you will say, well, this is such a, you know, legal uh, jargon. And it's not. It's really it can really inform other sectors and where is where are the humanitarian gaps? Sorry, I, I know that we don't have a lot of time, but I, I hope this is helpful and happy to to link um, link up and talk, talk more about our experience in the Americas. No, thanks so much, Marilena. Please don't don't be sorry because this is so it is so interesting and it is it, it's exactly as you say. I think that the perspective now that you have emphasized uh, and you have already had the fin I, I, you have already concluded the process, so you also have. Um, it's interesting to hear from you, also for the colleagues, uh, you know, like like Claire and others that are still working on this to really see how they can strengthen the analysis, keeping this in mind, not the causal uh, links, as you said, you know, the perspective of the service providers and all of that. This is just so interesting and it is often the missing um, link. Um, I know that we only have a few minutes left, but I just wanted to open the floor just to see then if, if the, there are any colleagues online um, that have any comments or questions uh, um, for our for all our, our speakers and Paola and uh, Claire and Iad and Maria Elena before we, we come to a conclusion. Please, uh, Catherine, good to see you. And likewise, and thanks so much, all colleagues, and, and super helpful with these two examples, well, even three with also Tunisia, to hear about the how it's being applied in practice. And thanks, Maria Elena, for your recommendations also on how to, yeah, how to manage, basically, and how you can draw also on the protection analytical framework, the path and the experiences with that. Just one question, and maybe also for the previous colleagues, Claire and uh, Iela, in terms of uh, did you take out elements of the love? Because uh, as you were pointing to, Paula, you can use it in different ways on a specific theme, on a specific group, in a specific location, focusing mostly on one pillar or what. So I'm just curious in terms of applying it and, and recognizing that it can indeed be quite an undertaking. If you uh, made choices of uh, taking parts of the lab or focusing on specific elements, thanks. Marilena, please. Yeah, so we we kind of decided not to go on into certain gra granular questions that were not useful, but we did go through the soft pillars. Um, and, and I think for us, it was needed because we saw those gaps. We decided not to go too in depth into the first pillar on, on you know, like the, the more, um, we wanted to make this accessible. So we didn't want this to turn into a, a legal um, analysis. And that was a conscious decision as well. So we, and, and you know, the draft and the drafts, they were cut. But, um, but I think that was very important that we steered the decision in, into focusing on the three, uh, the, pillar two, three, and four, to really ensure that this was going to talk to practitioners as well. And then certain questions, we we kind of decided this is not relevant if we don't if if we don't uh, use this part or or if we don't have enough information, we we take it out. But in general, we kind of follow the uh, the the, the soft pillars. 
Thank you so much. And Claire, please. Yeah, so same. Um, uh, we focused uh, on the pillar three, uh, two, three, and four, uh, still uh, having a broader read of the legal aid and justice context. Uh, but the focus uh, is definitely more on the legal aid needs, uh, root causes of uh, issues to access justice, the consequences of the absence uh, and what are the, the issues and challenges that are faced by the target population related to these issues and then the existing capacities and response. Um, so these three pillars, obviously, taking into consideration the um, restrictions of access and sensitiveness of uh, legal aid issues in the country. Um, in terms of uh, the issues that we're going to look that we are looking at and that we're going to look at as well in the future, we um, we of course look at what we know and what we are working on and what we will have as a, a group an impact on, right? So according to our own expertise and areas of intervention, it will be eventually harmful and not justified for our three agencies to have a look at what we do not have expertise on and what we would not be able to address uh, in the sense of not to raise any expectations and not to uh, shine the lights on uh, issues that we would not have necessarily answers or practical um, yeah practical answers to uh, and eventually no uh, no expertise on the matter. So, for example, everything that is looking at uh, uh, specific uh, legal aid for GBV, um, um, uh, criminal responsibility. Uh, so, all of these, uh, all of these very specific issues that NRC, DRC, and IRC are not uh, looking at in Libya specifically are not going to appear in the analysis. Uh, we focus our analysis, of course, on um, issues that are faced by uh, non-Libyans population in Libya, because these are the most, uh, <laughs> the population that most in need in Libya, right? So here we're talking about asylum seekers, refugees and, uh, and migrants, knowing that uh, and, uh, very, very quickly in a nutshell, there is no recognition of the refugee status in Libya. I'm not going to go on that field because it's not the purpose, but just um, to 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 explain on why uh, legal aid challenges are arising for this population because of the absence of international protection of these groups and all of the consequences that uh, that follows. Um, we as well, um, we will see how we include as well uh, legal aid challenges that are seen by uh, Libyan population and specific groups, especially those who are still displaced and returnees and uh, stateless with uh, the current um, uh, limitations that we have in terms of access. So for the moment, very focused on non-Libyans and then we see how we can include other um, populations. Over to you, Martina. Thanks very much, uh, Claire and Marina. That, make, that, make, that makes a lot of sense and also raises some of the, of course, the dilemmas in terms of the scope of the of, of the use of the tool. And um, Marilena, I see that there's a question for you in the chat, but I also first let uh, Chinook, please, from uh, IRC, who's also doing a lot of work, of course, as we have had, you know, on, on using the tools and strengthening this legal analysis and legal aid analysis. Um, please, Chinook, uh, Yes, thank you, Martina. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Very uh, interesting. Um, I think what I like, as you said, Martina, we're working uh, currently on a, on a legal uh, legal analysis uh, toolkit, etc. And it was very interesting for me to see that the concern you raise, the question you have asked yourself during the process, were very similar to the question we all have, I think, in this process. And to this, I wanted to speak to some of them that you have raised. Um, so the first one is uh, we are really, tr you know, I think you, you know, Angeliki was uh, worked on the path. You have mentioned the path uh, several times, Maria Elena. And so we also trying to, so the first concern I see is how we link and how we show and we demonstrate the link between protection and legal. Um, I think the first step we're really working and emphasizes here. 
Uh, and I think it actually links back to the second concern that I see you have and we're also working on. So, you know, maybe we'll need follow up discussion um, on this, you know, the legal needs list that you were talking about. I think what we were, what we are thinking is to not necessarily, because we have this issue, like you have the list of the, the list of the risks that is uh, pretty, uh, pretty clear, as you were saying. And how do you move to the legal, the legal list? So we were not personally talking around uh, legal needs, but we are talking about legal thematics in, te in the sense that we take all the protection risk and we know that all of those risks are linked to legal in some way, being a law, the threat, legal giving the threat as the law is, you know, threat being a vulnerability, being whatever, and we're looking at that and then it moves us to the legal thematic. That's how we, but I, I like actually the list you did on legal needs, so I, I would love to have further discussion with you, a technical in-depth discussion. But uh, but I think this is where we all, I, I like that this, this is the where we all struggle, we're all trying to think about better ways, so I uh, really love that. And uh, the second question, small comment, but also question to you both, um, it's, and we are trying to focus also on that, on how we link all this analysis to the response. I think being protection monitoring, traditional protection monitoring or whatever, when we listen to the to the donors, and also for us personally, I think it's better to link any analysis to response, right? So we're trying to, to think of that. And we know that to do that, I mean, what not we know, but we are from our experience, <laughs> to do that better, it's we have to link to specific thematics. So Claire was we're just saying that they have chosen specific thematic to link to their response and intervention, right? And um, and that's also um, how we try to how we struggle to have a global tool that respond to very localized, you know, analysis. Um, I wonder also how in in which detail did you go to analyze the law, to analyze the practice, to also analyze. Particularly, I, I'm not too sure about uh, Latin America context, but I assume in Libya and Tunisia, there's a lot of link with informal and customary justice. So how do you analyze all of that to really link to a safe legal response, you know, on how to work and engage with all those actors? So that's, I assume that's also the question you, you are responding to. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, please. Um... Claire? Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, uh, Chanel, for the for the questions. Very interesting. Um, so yes, of course, uh, we we include in the analysis uh, parts of uh, access to um, informal, customary, uh, alternative uh, dispute resolutions. Uh, so even though the analysis is not focused on these uh, dispute mechanisms, alternate, alternative dispute uh, mechanisms, uh, it refers to in practice uh, what source of um, legal support um, affected populations are relying on. So obviously it's part of, uh, it's part of the analysis with, um, yeah, with still a focus on uh, formal uh, legal aid service providers and uh, and how we as agencies can support a uh, formal way of uh, of accessing just context of Libya, right? So the idea is not necessarily to draw recommendations on uh, formal justice mechanisms, but then uh, but then see what are the challenges and what are the existing resources. Um, as they are today, right? So the, exi the existing resources are formal and informal. Uh, yes, and then how do we use this analysis to draw our own support and draw our own um, our own programming? Of course, uh, we are using the analysis uh, to draw our strategies to to shape uh, our strategies and intervention. And this is the whole. I mean. One of the main objectives of using the LAF, right, is to have a common analysis and a common understanding that is triangulated, that is shared, that is done in consultation, that takes the overall picture so we can see, um, as for uh, NRC, DRC, IRC, within our own 
uh, areas of expertise where we could have an added value and what is missing, not to miss any analysis and not to miss any opportunity or challenge uh, and being able to work together and coordinate the best that we can. So this is the main, uh, yes, so obviously we are using these analysis to shape our intervention and make sure that we are relevant. Um, yes, and that we look at at least medium uh, outcome to long-term outcomes. So, uh, yes, I see that Leah is uh, as his end up um, and Lisa as well. So over to you, Martina. I don't want to give the floor. <laughs> no, no, uh, please. I know, I know, and I don't know if Lisa, you're trying to remind me that we are over the time that we are allocated for the session. But uh, please, uh, yeah, and then to you, Lisa. Okay, very quickly uh, to uh, to address the very important question of uh, Chinook. So in Tunisia, we don't have customary uh, uh, justice system, but uh, and uh, thanks to the LAF uh, exercise, I discovered as Tunisian that we have a parallel uh, legal, uh, how do you call it, conflict resolution system. And this was really a big uh, discovery uh, uh, that was Thanks to the to the laugh exercise and thanks to the key informant interview that we conducted, that we discovered that in some um, migrants communities, because of the lack of uh, trust in the judicial official judi judicial system, some of the migrant communities they have developed their own parallel uh, conflict resolution uh, resolution uh, mechanisms. And for me, as a lawyer, it was really surprising to discover this because. Under Tunisian law, this is even uh, prohibited. We can, you cannot like uh, uh, go through a parallel conflict mecha resolution mechanism. So yeah, um, the last exercise has showed that there are some like parallel conflict re resolution mechanisms that are uh, due to the to the um, reasons we all know lack of trust lack of efficiency of the judicial uh, system uh, in some countries uh, some some parallel uh, resolution conflict mechanism uh, they 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 uh, appear in some specific uh, communities especially in tunisia i'm talking about migrants in some areas of the country so yeah this was a very like uh, yeah, it was a discovery for 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 us, uh, like uh, legal pr practitioners, uh, through the laugh exercise. Thank you very much. Yet, please, Lisa. Uh, no, I was going to say it's not my job to stop a, a good conversation happening. Um, you might just see me vanish, but the recording will continue. But so please don't stop. Um, no, I, my my comment was actually less to do with the analysis and was more. Um, Someone texted me at the start and said, your job's very easy, you know, and I was like, yes, I think when these discussions are well organized, they're pretty easy. But um, like for me, I think seeing the legal discussion of protection sort of being put back into the discussion um, as a sort of the protection analysis is very interesting, but I think the legal analysis is to the core of the work that we're trying to do. So I, just to say that I really enjoyed the session and I've enjoyed sort of having that um, protection anchor sort of put uh, put put in the discussion but I, I will buy out and let people um continue thank you so much lisa and it is and we know that it's sometimes it is difficult to find you know the time and the space for that so we appreciate and maria elena please before maybe i just give the floor to paula and catherine for some final remarks and we conclude the session for today please maria elena Yes, maybe just to address the question that Monica asked, uh, the idea was not to represent a common understanding. I think for us, one of the challenges, it, and I think this is something that we have to reflect on, this is the first time when, that we do this and we started doing it in DRC, but we did, uh, as you can see in, in the presentation, most of our data was from DRC because it's the data that we had more access to. And and, I, and we are pushing different um um, different joint exercises, especially, for example, in the Venezuela cluster, we're trying to push this idea of doing it, doing joint analysis, and we would like to move towards that. And I think for us, that was very clear in terms of sending that that survey into seeing the perspective of other legal practitioners that were not part of DRC, that were also outside of the classical INGO UN system. So we also had that um, 
that service sent, for example, to legal clinics in universities, which was very important for us to have as well that perspective. Um, and just to go back to what Shinuk was saying, I think for me that the, the, the goal of this exercise was definitely how do we link it with the response. And I think that in, uh, very differently in the Americas, right, we do have a legal system that is super robust, right? Like the, 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 for example, the definition of uh, of a refugee eligibility in in the uh, of Car the Cartagena Declaration is domesticated in most countries, and yet the access to international protection is three percent. So, so you know, it's these gaps. How do we work through those gaps when we have a very robust legal legal system in, in place and in institutions, but we see those gaps? Where, where are those um, needs? And at the end of the of of our uh, of our analysis, we do provide recommendations for humanitarian actors, but also for also for duty bearers. From what we saw, we saw in the analysis, and I think for us already in DRC, we're reflecting a lot on how we adjust our programming after this. Um, but but I think it's important to to always link it. If not, uh, there is just you know producing for producing. We have to really adopt those recommendations. Thank you so much, uh, Marilena, for these final comments from your side as well. Um, Paula and Katrin, so I don't know if you have just a final word before we conclude. Thanks. Paula, I, I, we're already yeah. over time, so I don't want to take time. I think it's amazing that people are willing to stay 15 extra minutes and have this conversation. We started uh, by saying maybe we have to close earlier because there will be no comments, but that was not a problem. Uh, and for me, it's just uh, I think uh, it, it makes uh, it, it emphasizes the need to continue talking on how we use the analysis and how we use the laugh and continue sharing because you see there seems to be always learning and comparison from one exercise to the others because contexts are very different. The partners will be different and how we do it will be different. So hopefully uh, we can continue doing that. And yeah, thanks again for everyone sharing. It was a really very rich conversation. Super interesting. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Katrin. And Paula, to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Martina and Kat, for providing the opportunity to again uh, facilitate the session on, on LAF. And I think uh, thanks, uh, Claire, Maria Elena, and Yad for providing really field uh, experience on the use of a global toolkit that, uh, as, uh, as, as such, uh, it's uh, uh, overcompassing, but it cannot be adapted to uh, several con to each context. So it was great to see uh, that the LAF is being used by single agency, by protection cluster, by group of agencies, and with different scope, uh, with different target group, with different uh, emphasis on different pillars. Uh, and I think the note from Maria Elena, thanks so much for your last clarification. I think uh, we are one year, I would say one year and a half into uh, the implementation of the LAF. Uh, and we see great results in terms of analysis. I imagine one year from now, we could already uh, see more reflection on how to move from the analysis to the action. So I'm sure uh, we will be there as Kat proposes uh, in uh, continuing di discussing and exchanging on uh, how to move uh, and adjust programming, as you say, uh, and uh, incorporate also national counterparts um, uh, to ensure un ownership of these results uh, uh, from, from the humanitarian and the development community. So thank you so much. Fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Paula, to all our speakers today, uh, Claire, Iad, Maria Elena, um, all of you that have joined us as, uh, for the extra time as well. Um, we are there to support you. So if you want to start a conversation no more or, you know, on how to use this tool, then please feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'd be happy to help you. And uh, you'll hear more from us soon. And, uh, and of course, the GPC um, series, learning series continues. So you'll have another uh, session coming up soon enough, uh, and I hope you'll 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 register in there. You found this session useful today as well. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, we'll be in touch. Bye. Have a good rest of the week. Bye bye. Goodbye.